Welcome to South Bank University and to the Edric Theatre. And for those of you listening on the Big Finish podcast of this event, uh, it is, of course, named after that lady in the Time Meddler who gives William Hartnell a drink. <laughs> We're the guests of the university and its Department of Culture, Writing and Performance, and we are particularly the guests of, of Colin Harvey. So this is Module 13, Rob Shearman. <laughs> Rob is a very diffident man, uh, or he pretends to be, anyway. So for the next few moments, I'm going to be playing the part of his ego. Alan Aitbourne, <laughs> Francis Ford Coppola and Martin Jarvis are among his greatest admirers. And why do they love him so? I think it's because Rob has a voice that's uniquely his own, one that's audible in his radio plays, in his stage work, in his television drama and in his fiction, whether he's asking us to imagine a pig in the Garden of Eden or the year 1574 unfurling like a giant canvas over the surface of the earth or a man in love with the ghost of Hitler's dog. I think there's a similar idiosyncrasy in Rob's relationship with the reader or the listener. The novelist B.S. Johnson cut holes in his books to allow the reader to look forward to a later part of the text, or he published them loose leaf. Rob is also interested, I think, in similar experiments, but they're ones that work to create an extraordinarily intimate connection with the reader. Rob's series for Radio 7, The Chain Gang, began telling a story that was then surrendered to the listeners before being taken back to be brought to a conclusion by Rob. Certain copies of Love Songs for the Shy and Cynical, his second collection of stories, featured one handwritten by Rob. His third collection, which, were, which he and Big Finish are launching into the world tonight, could well contain a story featuring you. This event also features you. There'll be time to ask questions of Rob at the end. There'll be roving mics that are going through the audience. But first, let's get the man himself out to read the opening story of the collection, Coming Into Land. Rob Shearman. Ladies and gentlemen, we hope that you have taken pleasure in this air intercontinental flight from Los Angeles to Paris, France, that you've enjoyed the in-flight entertainment system, that you've enjoyed our specially prepared meals and snacks. We hope that you've taken the chance to sit back and relax and maybe sleep as we've crossed all those time zones. We now need to inform you we will soon begin our descent into Paris and we ask you to pay attention to the following information and act upon it accordingly. We are currently cruising at an altitude of 30,000 feet at an airspeed of 400 miles per hour. The time at our destination is 1325, so do remember to change your watches if you haven't already done so. The weather looks good, and with a tailwind on our side, we're expecting to land in Paris approximately 50 minutes ahead of schedule. The weather in Paris is sunny but cloudy, with a high of seven degrees in the afternoon. You may need to wrap up warm. There's a chill to the evening. If the weather cooperates, we might get a great view of the city as we descend. We hope that may be possible. The captain says he'll do his best. That would make it easier for everybody. It all depends upon the clouds. We're fighting these damn clouds. We will soon be rocking all toilets prior to our arrival in Paris, so this would be a good time to use the facilities if you've not yet had the occasion to do so. Go now. <laughs> it's all right. We'll wait. I'm sorry that's all the time we have. I'm sorry. These stories are very focused on the idea of memory, aren't they? I mean, we heard that in yes. this one. These people almost seem constituted by yeah. the ideas in their heads. Why was this idea so important to you? It was a strange thing, because I thought I'd do a book about, about history. And I, and I found, actually, a few days ago, I was looking through my old notebooks. I was trying to tidy up my office, as my wife will be thrilled to know. And, um, and I found a list of the 21 stories I wanted to write, because they were related to all the centuries past the, you know, past the birth of Christ. And I had about five of them, which actually are really in the book. 
Other things were sort of general stories set in history. And it's weird that, that actually there's not a single story in the book now which is really set in history at all. They're all sort of about history in the way that we perceive history. And memory is sort of a big part of that. And yeah, sort of the, the idea that we sort of lose things all the time and that, and that who we think we are is always in doubt if we can't hold on to those memories for certain. So what about the structure of the book then? Yeah. This is this is this is organised around yeah. The, I mean, the historical yes. calendar. Yes. Fact, I mean, well, it? I mean, to be fair, I mean, what happens originally is you just get a few ideas for stories. You write them down. You think maybe as I write the, this, the, there'll actually be a theme, which comes out of the book or you know book in the first place. That's what happened with the last two I did. Are you anxious about your place in history, about posterity? Not desperately. I mean, in a way, <laughs> none of us. <laughs> None of oh. us can quite disappear in the way that we used to, particularly um, if you write. Everything no, is there, isn't I, it? It I'm, doesn't get destroyed. I'm quite resigned to the fact, actually, that I now know that when I die, there'll be a gravestone and there'll be a Dalek on it. Um, <laughs> and, I, and actually, I have no problem with that. I mean, it's a funny thing, because you know, for, for so many years, um, I was writing basically stage plays and I would go to parties and things, and people do that question that they always ask. You know, you know, they ask you what, what you do for a living, you say you're a writer, and they say, oh, anything we'd ever have heard of? And I'd say, yeah, probably not, really. Not unless you were in a theatre somewhere in Exeter in 1994. And now what people say to me at parties, you know, what do you do? And I say, well, yes, I'm a writer. And I look a bit smug. And they say, anything we'd have heard of? I say, yes, I think you might have. <laughs> um, and it, it's quite weird and in a funny way. Actually, it sort of changed my idea of writing enormously. I didn't... I didn't feel actually feel very comfortable at the time we're doing Doctor Who because I, I, I sort of resented the idea of part that I was now, that something I was writing would be always more famous and more popular and bigger than I could ever be. And actually now it sort of, it feels a bit reassuring in a sort of funny way. It means I can sort of reach off it, <laughs> which I quite like. Because, I, I, you know, because I am, you know, shamelessly aware that when people review my, my, my books in, 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 you know, in, in, in major newspapers, it always opens with, from the man who brought back the Daleks. And I think without that, I wouldn't even probably get that, get that crit. So I'm quite grateful, really, for that. And why the short story? Because this is a form that you have devoted yourself to for yeah. the last few years. Um, I really found it very, very surprising just how free I felt writing it. I think every few years you have to try and sort of reinvent yourself a bit. Um, I mean, probably not as consciously as that, but I find I always have to. And I was writing theatre for a number of years, and that was, and that's, you know, and, and I really love being a theatre writer, and I, and I still love theatre very much. But I began to find that I was probably repeating myself, and I had to therefore shake myself up, and I went into TV and radio more. And then that got a little bit predictable, and I wasn't, I wasn't really very happy after doing Doctor Who for a while. I, I felt that that the projects I was being offered weren't really things which were about the way that I write and what I wanted to say. I, I mean, I, I was on Crossroads, which I don't usually say very much, but I was for about, for about two weeks back in about 2003. Actually, yeah, because, because they give you the actual story and, and all the characters, and you think, well, it's all been done for me. It's as easy. And it really isn't. And the episode I was given, nothing happened. A lot. And episode before... The lead actress had shagged the chef on the floor of the kitchen. And my episode was all about how they couldn't talk about it. And they said, in the script, we want them to talk, not talk about it at least four times. <laughs> so I kept writing things where people didn't, you know, I, I wrote one sequence in where the lift doors open and she's there and he's walking past and they sort of just turn their backs. I, I, I did that quite a lot. And I thought when I wrote it, I can do a Harold Pinter type thing. I can be really experimental. That's not really what they wanted, actually. Um, <laughs> So I left Crossroads. Uh, they weren't that thrilled with me being there. And yeah, and so the short stories just came about. Um, I got an offer. Uh, somebody wrote to me, uh, Ra Page at Comma Publishing, asked if I would contribute to an anthology. Um, and I think because of Doctor Who. And I wrote back saying, I don't write prose. And then I read the other contributors, and they're people like Hanif Koreshi was doing it, and, and uh, Jeremy Dyson. And I just thought, I really admire them, and this is silly, because people try to break into doing books all the time, and I'm being offered something which I'm not even, I'm not even going to give it a go. So I went away and wrote a short story, I gave it a try, and I loved it, and they commissioned an entire book out of that. 
which I was thrilled to do. And I haven't really. Is it Tiny Deaths? That. that was Tiny Deaths, yeah. Um, you also feel, because they're, they're, they're a very, very minor um, regarded medium. Short story collections do not sell very well. Well, in publishing terms, that's yeah. certainly true. I mean, when a pub if you go to a publisher and, and say, I want to write a book of short stories, their eyes quickly oh, glaze absolutely. over, don't they? A absolutely And right. it seems that now they're going to be banished from the radio, too. Yes, I know, which is shocking. Um, very, very worrying. A couple of stories in the last book were, were commissioned by Radio 4 originally. And that's how, you know, again, that, that gives you another way into doing, to writing for an audience. Because I was imagining that every short story that I write is pretty much as if it was going to be performed as well, because I rather like that idea. And so I love the idea of doing the idea of that sort of Radio 4 broadcasting. And, and that is a way in which people can write short stories. And, and, and so many outlets for doing that, that entire thing are now dying. So in some, you know, probably perverse way, I really want to stick at it. And I really want to try and do a lot more of them. Um, so it's sort of about how you go about writing and thinking about coming into land as an example. I'm sort of assuming, so shoot me down in flames if I'm wrong, but I'm sort of assuming you start at the beginning and work through to the end as you write to a certain extent. Sometimes. Okay. Uh, it, it changes. Uh, sometimes you just get the idea. I mean, uh, for some stories, you end up writing a paragraph or two which you hang around for five, six years for, I mean, which has happened in several instances in that book. Um, things actually which I've still got, which I then abandoned, you can finish off later on, and they might be mid midway in the story. Other times you have the, you have the ending in mind. You're not quite sure how to get there. Coming into land, I had this, this, the, the idea for about two years before I wrote it. I couldn't really work out how to write it. And I couldn't work out that for about, for that two years, it was really, it, that it was a, a monologue. I was trying to write it in my head as a, a proper third person adventure and I thought this is stupid I mean how do you explain this and so you get the, so they always vary I mean sometimes the ideas just sort of come out I mean, it's wonderful when they do actually even though it does seem a bit easy when you just get an idea and it comes out fully formed and you write it the next day and it's done and it's really good that's brilliant and, it, and it's quite rare and sometimes and there's a story in the book which took me four years to write I just kept on rewriting it which is the final story mm. the, the uh, Twin Towers one which I just kept on throwing away and starting at scratch again because, because the ideas weren't quite working. So, so it can be, I mean, every single story seems to have its own rules about how to do it. You've talked about script writing and prose writing and you've come to prose writing in the last four or five years, I think you said? That's right, yeah. Um, what, was, what do you think are the sort of big differences or was there anything that surprised you in, in writing in different forms? I couldn't see how prose writing ever worked until I was about in my mid-30s. It just seemed to me ludicrously hard to have that number of words and to have people saying things but also then having to walk and do things because actually I've been writing I think because my background was always drama because I wanted to be an actor when I was a kid a bit and I was rubbish and so I began moving into writing drama rather than actually you know performing it um, I never really thought of I thought prose writing was proper writing and I thought what I was doing was sort of pretend acting for many, many years. And so realizing that, I, I remember doing that, that very, very first short story, which is called Mortal Coil, which is in Tiny Deaths, and going out that day and laughing at myself, even trying this, because I would expose myself as a fraud immediately. And I suddenly found actually, as opposed to drama, I mean, the, the, the problem that you have writing drama is you have to keep vamping to keep people not coming on stage at the right time. You have people have to have to invent conversations. I could then sort of say, three years later, and it was easy. I could just suddenly cut out all of the boring stuff. And it was really good to do that. And I suddenly thought that prose is terrific. It means that I can just get to the heart of everything I want to say and then move on. And it meant that um, it just seemed suddenly like I was just taking all the essence of things. OK, well, I think it's now time to let Rob get back to his writing. Thank you very much, Rob. Thanks, Thanks Matthew. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.